No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending. It'll take him a second. We have the Triscodecophobia nurse handing out flyers. Yep, there she goes. Very apt, I must point out, because this panel, ladies and gentlemen, is called Very Superstitious. It's about psychology, it's about beliefs, it's about weird things, the research, and when is superstition the way? What I have in front of me is a classic example of collections of information about uh, superstitions. It's the Oxford Dictionary. And many of us who are here might be very intrigued by superstitions, might even have a few superstitions. And so in order to investigate this further, a very fascinating field of work, we have a variety of of members of this panel and I'd like to thank all of them and they will be introducing themselves from the end but first of all I am Kylie Sturgis of the Token Skeptic podcast. I do come from Australia so the accent is indeed different to the average American and uh, one of the things that I studied as a part of my Masters of Education degree is uh, looking at the psychology of superstitions and looking specifically at superstitions within Australia. Myself and Dr Martin Bridgestock did what was possibly the largest paranormal belief survey in Australia that has been conducted yet. And so superstitions is something that is, of course, of interest to me and hopefully of interest to you. Let's learn more about these interesting people here from the end. Uh, I'm Barbara Drescher, and I'm a cognitive psychologist, and I teach research methods, or I did until this semester, at uh, CSU Northridge. So um, I do teach a bit about superstitions. Um, I also did uh, some research on it when I was in grad school, because I do think it is a fascinating topic. So we'll, hopefully we'll get into that a little bit. Um, my name is Stephen King, really, and um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a local skeptic with the Atlanta Skeptics, but I'm also a, an actor. I've been acting since high school, and um, there's a lot of superstitious stuff in when you deal with theater and theater people, so uh, I have a lot of experience with that. So I'm uh, Steve Novella. There we go. I'm a cl clinical neurologist and a host of the Skeptics Guide podcast. And I was told I was going to be on a panel with Stephen King. <laughs> you are. I guess just, you're just unlucky. So. I'm, I'm a Stephen King, not right. the Stephen King. Ah, uh, gotcha. <laughs> uh, I'm Bob Blaskowitz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Georgia Tech here in town. Um, I teach writing classes and. Uh, that take as their topics extraordinary claims. I also write for Skeptical Humanities. Excellent. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, how do we define superstitions? What do we know about formal superstitions? What do we come up with when we just talk about it in a general, general term? Well, it, it's funny when you you know we have a, a official definition you know in psychology and and um, I, I actually looked it up on dictionary.com while we're sitting here. And it says a Okay. <laughs> They're going to do that's that podcasting. They have a ah, lovely time. Yeah. Make okay. sure you check out their track, please. <laughs> uh, a belief or notion not based on reason or knowledge in or of the ominous om ominous significance of a particular thing, circumstance, occurrence, proceeding, or the like. Eh, it's close. Uh, I think it's a belief or notion um, not based on reason. It may be based on some knowledge, though because it some of it's born out of illusory correlation so if i did this and this happened then mm. um our tendency is to think that those will happen again and it usually involves some sort of a causal relationship mm. uh, did i answer the question yeah or, you, or was you there did. another part i missed no that was excellent uh, any further points that people want to add well i think phenomenologically if i had to encapsulate it i would define it as hyperactive pattern recognition mm -hmm. combined with hyperactive agency detection fueled by a desire for the sense of control. Mm. That's phenomenologically, I think, what it is. That results in the, what a superstition is, which is what, what the definition that we heard, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I, you know, uh, when I found I was going to be on, on, on the panel, I kind of looked into, uh, into the... the, the uh, the, the stories that are kind of behind these 
uh, superstitions, uh, and they, they, they actually something that, that struck me as, as, as remarkable is that they're all rooted in everyday events, and that they give you kind of a window. Uh, most of these were collected um, uh, either by uh, folklorists in the late 19th century uh, in England or Ireland, um, and it really gives you a window into the lives of these people and what the, what they were imbuing with with magical influence or powers. Um, so if you have, you know, let's say a, uh, a uh, let's say you take a bread bowl and you see it flipped over on the table and you live in a fishing community, you don't want to get in your boat that day because it's going to flip over, you know, and so they use it as kind of portents. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, imbuing the, the, the everyday world with, with magical powers, magical significance. Yeah. So all of us come from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, I remember the first panel that I ever did for the uh, Skeptic Zone podcast here when it was first launched back in, oh, let me see, four Dragon Cons ago. We had uh, Dr. Ginger Campbell, another podcaster up here. One of the things I really dearly wanted to ask her about was about her job as a emergency physician and superstitions involved with that because I thought to myself, she's a scientist, she's surrounded by fellow doctors all the time and yet um, emergency situations can become very superstitious situations. You desperately want control over circumstances. And she told some fabulous stories about how the Q word was forbidden on the floor. It's a quiet night. Because as soon as she said quiet, that was it. All hell was going to definitely break loose. And so they had code words and, and different ways of saying things in order to ward off a potential disaster whilst they're working on there. Do you have similar circumstances in, in your own careers? I mean, I'm looking here at Stephen King <laughs> pointedly because, I'm sorry, you work in a place where uh, yeah. the M play is never mentioned, for yeah, example. Yeah, I'm sure most everyone has probably heard about uh, the whole deal with Macbeth. Which is uh, does this count as a stage, by the way? Do you have to do something? Yeah, and thank you for saying that out loud. Yes, everyone together, Macbeth. Yes. All right, we have to all have to go outside. I have to oh. turn around three times, curse, spit, and walk. Ask permission to walk back in. Really? Yes. Wow, that's what it is. That's one. There are variations, but mm -hmm. that's uh, that's the one that'll happen. The Shakespeare Tavern, if you ever say it, and you're an actor. If you're a patron, you can get away with it because what can they do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it, it, it stems from the, the folklore behind it is that there was a, a tragic production of Macbeth. Not really tragic, but there were a lot of things that happened, mistakes. You know, uh, people got injured. There were some issues with, I think, the lights. And things happen in live theater. And for whatever reason, you know, because it's a, it's a tragedy, it's also a dark play. It's got a lot of fighting, but it's very dark not only thematically but also you know dealing with lighting or whatever so if people aren't paying attention they've got a sword in their hand they come running up to a bunch other group of people who have swords in their hands and they can't see very well there might be fog things happen <laughs> uh, but of course people yeah. Sometimes just on say purpose. <laughs> Yeah. See, already the curse is striking. I mean, yeah. what more evidence do you need? Yeah. <laughs> there's trapdoors, there's sandbags, there's fly wires. I yeah. mean, there's ghosts and witches flying about in Macbeth as well. If you get exactly. a really in inventive production, you're stuffed, aren't you? And some people believe that the, uh, the lines spoken by the witches are mm. actual, that Shakespeare went and talked to real witches, and uh, that the lines were supposedly authentic spells, and so that's part of the curse. Uh, wow. Yeah. That's it. But uh, so it's some act, I mean, it's, it depends on who you talk to, really. I know some people who they, one of the associate producers at the Shakespeare Tavern down the street uh, doesn't believe in the curse, and, but the stage manager does. <laughs> and uh, he will, he always loves when the show's being produced because he will just recite lines in the building and she can't say anything to him because he might be rehearsing. Oh. So, but, uh, but yeah, it just really depends on who you, who, you have to know who the people are that you can't say it around. But I even, even as a skeptic, I still just say the Scottish play just to not have to deal with it. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about yourself, Steve? Have you ever come across that? Well, yeah. I mean, I think what you were saying about the emergency room is generalizable to medicine, at least hospital care, essentially because admissions are random events mm -hmm. that strike without warning and dramatically dump a bunch of work in your lap and make your life much more complicated, at least during your, your shift. 
Uh, so it's something we don't have control over. So yes, it, there is a, it's generally, uh, it's usually done tongue in cheek, but if you say, oh, it's been slow, or we haven't had that many admissions so far, or we have a small service, or anything that indicates that your workload is on the low end of the spectrum, you're gonna get somebody saying, oh yeah, you know, you, now you jinxed us, you know, now we're gonna get, the, the deluge is gonna come in. And it's always you know, sort of half serious, but you know that they are anxious about it. It's sort of that anxiety over the lack of control that maybe things are quiet right now, but in a moment, your life could become miserable. And, and oh. <laughs> that's, that's I think, what drives that. Mm. Um, so, you know, the other thing that I find uh, that I found when, when I was actually working in the emergency room was the lunar effect. Yes, which, I which love is, that one. Yeah. yeah, which is all correlation. The, my, my anecdote that I, that I tell every now and then is that uh, it, we were having a busy night in the emergency room, and a nurse said to me, or you know, to the to the room I was standing next to her, "Wow, it, we're really getting killed tonight. Is it a full moon out there?" Mm -hmm. And no, it wasn't a full moon. It was you know like whatever. It was a crescent moon. So I informed her of that, and she goes, "Oh," and then went on with her work. So it occurred to me that well, if there were a full moon that night, that would have you know the confirmation bias would have kicked in, and that would have confirmed for her that yeah there's this lunar effect but the negative correlation didn't dissuade her from believing in the lunar effect she just immediately expunged it from her attention and mm -hmm. forgot the message right and then she went on with her with her day it became a non-event that she that she didn't register mm -hmm. uh so i think that's that confirmation bias so once you once you perceive that a pattern might be there you will then your confirmation bias will reinforce it profoundly because you will notice everything that seems to confirm the pattern, um, and you will ignore the things that disconfirm the pattern. And it's one of those uh, subjects that keeps coming up again and again in research. I found just in a curse research about 15 different papers spread over a variety of areas, yeah. everything from Russia to to England, number in America, and all of them saying no correlation, no yeah, correlation, right. again and again. Right. Got to look at all the data points, not just the one you notice. Yeah. Right. I, I like the ones that try to explain it. Yeah. yeah and, and some of them are very rational explanations for something that doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the educational ones, educational oh. superstitions. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the superstitions that I've encountered um, are kind of manufactured traditions uh, mm -hmm. for, say, the university. You rub the, the mascot's belly, the bronze statue. The, I did Isn't my, there a nose somewhere of a piggy, I think, or on half the campus or something? Oh, in New York, a bull? Where people rub the nose for luck? I've heard about that. A the, number of statues there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, you, I don't know, maybe it's a Catholic school and they're just venerating St. Billiken at St. Oh, Louis University. Does hmm. anyone know what a Billiken is? Hmm. No, it's this like little evil gremlin imp thing that's, it's kind of the scariest mascot, I think. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it comes from uh, 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 Inuit folklore or something. But um, they, they rub the belly, you know, uh, uh, visitors to campus and alumni uh, rub the belly of the the uh, Billiken for good luck, but it's completely manufactured. Um, it, the reason there's a bronze there in the first place is because uh, the the president of the university uh, had it, someone made him a paper mache Billiken, and he decided to have it bronzed or have a cast or whatever and have it put up. And then he just put a little sign that said, "Rub the Billiken's belly for good luck," you know. And um, you can do that if you want, but I know what the freshmen do to it. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I'm not touching it. <laughs> and that's actually that. There, there's another one. Um, is it John Harvard? Mm. Um, that has, the might be the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah it's it's kind of the same thing. Um, the, it's just probably not a good thing. It got its <laughs> luster I, I a different a way. Disturbing. That, that they think that that luck has anything to do with how well they do in school. Yeah, yeah. That, that happens all the time. Yeah, I have um, regularly. Uh, we have something called the TE exams, the tertiary entrance exams, at the end of the year. And generally in a school, they're held in the, the gymnasium and the school hall, so a large area. And as a teacher, you might be asked, OK, the TE exam for your particular paper is finished. Can you go through and make sure you collect up all the papers and, and pick up any 
you know, leftover paper and stuff, recycle for next year. And I'll pick up um, leftover little lucky tokens. I've got a troll, I've got a Buddha, I've got a little skeleton, um, I've uh, gonks, lucky gonks. There was an episode of gonks. Mr. Bean where he was attempting to do an examination and he unpacked the one paper that he had and then he started to unpack his pencil case. Um, in fact, I think there was also another TV show, The Young Ones with Neil, who said it was a terrible exam. I unpacked my pencil, my lucky pencil, my lucky gonk, my spare lucky gonk, my two pencils, my extra eraser, and the guy said, stop writing, please. So by the time he unpacked everything, the exam was over. But yeah, I, f I find these little lucky tokens all the time, and, and students doing particular rituals, like um, uh, putting uh, little stars on their forehead or something like that, so they'll all be lucky for their exam. But when you study the effects of doing that, you actually mm. see that there is a beneficial effect, mm. even though it's purely Confidence. psychological. So it's sort of superstition feeding on itself. If you are superstitious, then when you do the thing that you think will make you lucky or, or ward off bad luck, you perform better because you're essentially treating your own anxiety and, you know, mm. and, and putting your mind at ease and that, that sort of makes its own luck as it were. So how do you how do we think about that then? Should we then this gets to the question that I know you wanted to talk about? Is, is it are superstitions benign or or harmful? I, I think that's kind of a little bit of a false dichotomy. It's sort of everywhere in between. But um, there is this you know the research that shows that like for sports yes. uh, stars who when they do their little ritual they do perform better because mm. they whatever it's part of their they're getting psyched up for their for their performance. Isn't, isn't there a bit of a compound there though? Because yeah. if, if they have a ritual to do, then the control or the thing you're comparing it to is not not doing the ritual, it's being forced not to do the ritual or being, or right. restra you know, restraining oneself from doing the ritual. And so it's not exactly a control, you know? Right, we'd want to compare it to not being superstitious in the first place. Exactly. So, you know, so I guess the question is, is having the superstition decreasing your performance and then you're just getting back to baseline by, by doing the lucky thing and maybe you would be there without the, mm -hmm. without the behavior if you weren't superstitious in the first place. That's what I think, but I don't know that there's research to show that because how would it be hard to control we'd, for? Yeah, we'd have to have an, uh, physiological measures of anxiety that we yeah. were not correlated with other right. things, which is a little tricky. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which ones intri uh, interest us if they're outside of our particular field? I mean, I've mentioned ones to do with school. I, I find the lucky charms that I l find left over in the classroom interesting. Ones outside. You, you mentioned sporting. Do you play a sport yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, I play a number of sports you know, over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think, I think when I was younger, if I could I get involved in any of the sporting superstitions, I don't, not that I recall. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're certainly rampant. Again, that gets to the um, the desire for control. Whenever there's a situation in which, you know, you don't have a lot of control over the outcome, gambling, you know, sporting events. Um, again, when your beeper's going to go off, things like that, anything like that, that sort of is beyond your control. That clearly drives superstition. Uh, and there was a recent study in the last, I think, in the last year, where they they looked to see how generalizable that was. So they would have uh, subjects relay a story and the, the treatment group uh, or the intervention group had to relate a story that put them in a position where they lacked control and then the control group had to relate a story that did not relate to their sense of control and then they essentially gave them a test of superstitiousness and the the subjects who were meant to, who were, were instructed to imagine themselves in a situation where they lacked control actually had more pareidolia than the ones that didn't. So it actually, the, the pattern recognition that leads to superstition generalized to seeing objects in random noise, you know, the visual pareidolia where you see a pattern in the sky or the face on the bark of a tree. So it seems that that's a general phenomenon, this sort of pattern seeking and the sense of control and the need for control seem to be related in that way, not just with the narrow manifestation of superstition. It, it makes sense too, I yeah. think. I, I think, you know, whenever I think of superstition, I think of all the, the research about pattern recognition because that's kind of, you know, how we study it okay. and how you, you can get people to press a button in a pattern or think that their response pattern to, say, random set of lights, they'll assume that there's a pattern there even when you tell them it's random. <laughs> and the most interesting I found was something we, we used to call pattern mat, um, probability matching. So you have a, a subject who is asked to predict, say, let's say there's only two locations, which left or right, where a target will appear. And they're told that the 
the um, target comes from a random distribution where on the left side it's 70% and on the right side it's 30%. And so if you want to perform optimally, you're always going to choose the left side because it's 70%. And yet people will match. They'll choose the left side 70% of the time and the right side 30% of the time, which, of course, it's lousy. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't help you very much. Uh, if you add money to it, people perform a little bit better. you know. Mm -hmm. But um, what we used to think is that they were matching the probability because they didn't understand the probability. And what was really happening was they didn't believe that it was random. Mm -hmm. What they ended up doing is having the computer choose, say, 100 trials at once and then breaking up the runs so that 70% were you know, on the left and 30 were on the right. But it wasn't random. It was pseudo-random. And they saw people actually change their behavior to optimal behavior. They started choosing the left all the time. So we don't even believe randomness when we see it because we're so used to seeing patterns and picking them out. Yeah, my, my favorite uh, example of that kind of research is when you, you have subjects like press different keys and the cursor will either like move to the left or move to the right as it works its way down the screen. And uh, they, essentially it was random. The, what, the keys they were pressing had absolutely zero influence over the way the, the cursor moved. But they, most of the subjects developed beliefs about the relationship between what the keys that they were pressing and what was happening on the screen. Of course they were all fake. They were false beliefs. They were false patterns because there was zero relationship. That was the setup. But they would develop these essential superstitions about their ability to influence the cursor. Like it always, if you hit a, whatever, a certain key will always move to the left, except when it doesn't. Then it moves to the right. <laughs> That's because your basic kind of thought process for a superstition. Except a, a small percentage, like 5% of the subjects, realized it was random. And they did it by doing a controlled experiment. They said, all right, I'm going to always hit the same key and see what happens. Oh, it doesn't have any influence. Let me hit this other key. That doesn't have it. So they, they did a controlled observation instead of just a naive observation. They did science, and the superstition went away. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and it, it, uh, without the, the process of science, we de naturally develop pattern recognition superstitions. But when you impose a, a scientific way of looking at the data, you realize, oh, it's random. There's no pattern there. It was a beautiful experiment. Oh, what about the other two gentlemen? Um, do you have particular superstitions that you're fond of or research that you've heard of that intrigues you that's outside of your field? Uh, well, I uh, did a little research into this a couple of years ago for mm -hmm. our Skept Camp. Um, oh. It was my presentation. And uh, I thought it was interesting how it seems the majority of the theater superstitions grew out of just things that happen in the theater not really like um there's a there's one that's kind of interesting it's the ghost light uh where the 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 superstition is that there's a light left shining on the stage at all you know at in the night to keep uh i mean i don't know if people still believe this but it, it's one that's been around for a while and uh to keep away ghosts and evil spirits or whatever oh. which by the way if you've ever been to a theater it's got a ghost. Every single <laughs> theater is haunted, even if they just built it. <laughs> it's haunted, just so you know. And there will be someone there who can tell you about it. Uh, I think they're on you know, salary. They're hired immediately. Um, but uh, the ghost, you know, it says the ghost light left on to keep, you know, ghosts, whatever. Uh, but it, it's actually a very practical reason. Because, you know, a theater, the stage is raised, mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of a drop-off. There are generally seats around there. If you're there at night, walking around, you don't really want to fall off of it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's good to have a light there, but then people attached this, you know, folklore to the light that's really there just for safety. Um, and I don't know. I, I don't. I didn't go in this in depth, and I don't know if there are any theaters out there or, or have been where the light was there for the ghost light purpose, not realizing that. Oh, by the way, this is also here for safety reasons. But um, and there's also another one that's similar where uh, I haven't really experienced as much, but apparently you're not supposed to whistle in a theater. Uh, it's supposed to be bad luck to whistle, uh, which also has a practical reason. Back before. Uh, Computerization and uh, and uh, mechanized uh, uh, 
flying uh, grids where they fly in either flats or, or lights or whatever. So like in Peter Pan or Wicked when you have people flying around on right. flywires. And also yeah. some, some theatres will have fly space uh, where back, backdrops will be dropped in and out. Yeah. Um, and back before mechanization, computerization, uh, the signals for that were, were whistles mm. for someone to, you know, swing something in or down. So if you just had someone whistling, not <laughs> someone's going to get a flat on their head. Oh. So you know it developed into a superstition that you don't whistle in the theater. Yeah. So I know in Arabic culture, um, whistling is known as the devil's music. And that's what intrigues me about superstitions um, in regards to other cultures and how they have different superstitions. When we were doing our survey, we decided to change one of our questions in regards to not just um, lucky numbers like 7 or 13. We said any number because we were aware that um, at the time it was uh, 2008 and the 2008 Olympics were held in China on the 8th of the 8th, 2008. And there were quite a lot of superstitions in regards to how this was going to be beneficial to the Olympics, that it was a lucky day, lucky time, and so forth. And, and so we, we ended up extending our, our survey question in that regard to see if they might be able to pick up on any uh, cultural influences on Australian beliefs in superstition. Yeah. Uh, do you have any ones of yours? Yeah. Boy, um, one of my... Uh, the, the one that I kind of like the most, um, above all things, is, is a... It's a, it's a medical superstition. It's a treatment for warts um, oh. that you you rub your your wart secretly on an adulterer. <laughs> and what? and and yeah, it's in the book. Oh. And <laughs> you rub your wart on an adulterer, and uh, your wart disappears. However, I I actually think that it was possibly a test for finding adulterers. Oh. I'm just saying. Does it does it have to be in the act of adultery? At, at the time, oh, that's, wow. That could be tricky. Yeah, yeah. That's wait, so, wait, wait, wait right there. I have one. to take my shoe off. <laughs> <laughs> so you would actually go up to someone with your wart on your thumb or whatnot, and the person would, ah, no, stay away. You think, oh, ha, guilty. <laughs> no getting those warts off of me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the, the, the interesting things, um, and this is kind of uh, topical to what you know I was doing earlier today, which was was barking for the the vaccine clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, as I was reading through this, and um, I, I noticed how many superstitions were directly related to whooping cough. Oh, and it and, and so you, it's actually if if you go through this, you realize what you know how devastating it was, and how mm-hmm. you, people were doing lots of crazy things um, in order to ward it off or to to, to speed healing. Um, and I compiled a little list. This is this one is a shout out to my homie, Elise. Um, so it's like desperate time and desperate measures. You'll do anything, including mm-hmm. resort yeah. to superstitions, in order to help yourself out. You would pass the baby underneath a donkey. What? Uh, <laughs> a couple of times. Uh, this was people remembered having this done to them as late as the 1930s, mm-hmm. um, and it was off, often accompanied by a ritual involving consuming the hair or milk of a donkey. Uh, you drop the afflicted into a grave nine times. Oh, you know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily like dropping babies into graves, but you know, you put the baby in the grave. I, I mean, that's that's what was at stake here. They're, they were thinking that maybe if you could put the baby in the grave, that would take care of the death. Hmm. You know, um, and all sorts of drinking. Um, you have to. There's a, a really good one was uh, sharing milk with a ferret. <laughs> Uh, I'm so. not so keen on the one. Uh, also about uh, serving afflicted children roasted mice. Yeah, well, you can oh. serve them roasted mice, or you can just desiccate the mice, and uh, and kind of you get this like, uh, I don't know, powder powdered mice, <laughs> and you put it in the first meal of the uh, first drink of the day and the last drink of the day of the of the sick person, and that's supposed to cure them. Oh. Um, but you can also fry your mice. <laughs> Rub the interior of the skin of the mice. Welcome the to superstition person. cooking classes. Turn it into a challenge. Oh, uh, yeah. Can, can we fricassee our mice? That, that makes it so much worse. What kind of wine do you have with mice? Yes. <laughs> what, what would you serve with your mouse? <laughs> what, the dessert that goes well with mice. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking if you put the powder in a drink, don't you get instant mice? <laughs> <laughs> Constitute the mice. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, if you fast on a Sunday and visit three different parishes, or um, oh, there was one other really good one. Oh, if you put a tr- uh, the the head of a trout into the mouth of the sufferer and let the trout breathe into the child's mouth. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that that that's supposed to help too. So, yeah. all, all attempting to yeah be be lucky enough to escape a really hideous disease, yeah. and and I guess that comes to the next question: When is it? Um, how influential are, are lucky superstitions and unlucky superstitions? Do you think uh, are most superstitions tied around this notion of chance and and hope? I mean, certainly it's all about control, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we have lucky superstitions and unlucky superstitions. Um, in regards to um, another thing that popped up uh, in regards to uh, the psychology of superstitions, one that uh, one of my students asked to me, of me was, um, when is it superstition and when is it a, po- a com- obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, a, a disorder actually... I get a lot of flack for just for being a psychologist, even though I'm not a clinical psychologist, yeah. um, just because we have disorders. But that word disorder is really meant to describe a situation in which there is something that interferes with your ability to function. And so if, if you actually look at the criteria in the manuals that um, psychologists use to guide their you know, diagnostic, um, it, it's really all of the criteria leads to does it interfere with your ability to function or other people because there are there are disorders that um, the person who's afflicted isn't bothered at all by that other people are but something like OCD if you can't get on a bus you know to get to work Hmm. because the bus driver won't wait for you to you know touch this part and that part and this part and that part and then count to 32 then you're you're dysfunctional, and that's when we would call it a disorder. And yet, we seem to forgive um, athletes, however, don't we? Yeah. When they do particular rituals, because I remember they'll hearing wait of a guy. Hmm? The wait for them. Uh-huh. There, there's one in particular, I can't remember his name, but there's a baseball player that I think is fascinating. It takes him about five minutes to get into the batter's box, and but they'll wait for him. So, mm-hmm. is that a disorder? Depends on where else he's doing that, I think. How well does he perform when he's actually in the batter's box after he's done it, I guess? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, you know, looking at the educational ones where they seem to be put together in order to form some sort of community, like all students, all freshmen pass underneath this arch, uh, but only on their first day of college. And then when they graduate, they leave and they pass under this arch again. You know, and that kind of that can create community, actually. And then mm. that's fine. Do um, they have to walk around it on the other days? Huh? Do they have to walk around it on the other days? Presumably, you know, did, did yeah, I don't know. Um, but um, so in, in, in that sense, it can build community, but if it separates you out from the community, then yeah. Yeah, but that could just be a tradition then, it's a, as long yeah. as there's anything you know, oh, it, no, magical it, attached to but it. If you, but if you go through it, you will drop out. That's that's the... the yeah, I love, do, do people really believe that, or is it just conforming to the community? Yeah. I, I know there's a a, um, uh, a tradition at Washington University in St. Louis of not stepping on this, this seal that's under uh, in a walkway uh, through a, a main building, and they take that very seriously. Yeah. They just don't they don't tread on it. No. Uh, I guess that boils down to. Um the big question about when is it harmful and when is it harmless, uh, as you said, when is it benign and when is it damaging? How bad can they get and, and how useful can they be? Do you encourage su- uh, superstitions, for example, uh, when you see people rehearsing in the theatre? Do you think to yourself, OK, this is going to build community when we're doing um, a production? Well, I mean, I think most actors do, you know, they don't do anything that's going to... Uh they know that you know they have once they're on stage they have to do their job Mm -hmm. um but you know there's a lot of ritual involved uh usually there's some kind of uh it's generally called a vocal warm-up or a warm-up but you know every the the company gets together and maybe does a theater game or does uh you know something that's it it doesn't qualify as as superstitious or whatever but it's tradition it's you know ritual to get ready for the show to kind of get psyched up for to go out there um i think i really haven't i I can't think of anything that's really been disruptive except the Macbeth thing can be 
<laughs> because if you have someone who really believes it and they're in a power position like director, stage manager, um, and you're rehearsing another show that isn't Macbeth, <laughs> and then you say it, everything has to stop. You have to go outside and do the thing. And then come back in and never get started again. And yeah, you know, it wastes time. It wastes everyone else's time for, you know, something that's just a superstition. So. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, in medicine, I think it's largely harmful. Because mm. medical superstitions generally are, as you say, like if you, if you do something, it, it'll uh, ward off disease or treat a disease or treat a symptom. Uh, and uh, because it's based upon... Um, you know, you know, a false pattern recognition. It, it's you, what the action, the activity is is worthless. And unlike, say, performance, like like sporting performance, um, if there's any real disease process at work, it's not going to have any influence. It doesn't make people better. You know, it doesn't help. Uh, so uh, you know, even if you think of it as like the placebo effect, um, it's that only really affects you know, people's maybe perception of their symptoms. It doesn't really alter the course of a disease. So it's it, but it, it could lead them into thinking that the treatment is effective and therefore could motivate them to forego actual treatment. Mm. So, that's, so it can interfere with, with medical management, right? Any further? No? Yeah, I think yeah. There's, a, there's actually, a, just to mention, there's the funniest ones that I can think of are the things that aren't, I'm not quite sure you describe them as superstitions. I think they're more urban legends. Mm -hmm. I think people actually think that they're true, that, that mm -hmm. there's a causal relationship there that they don't quite understand. Right. It's not necessarily something that couldn't have a causal relationship. One of my favorites is, how many of you flash the lights when you get to a red light? Because you think it's going to, you can change the red light. Ah, we got one in the yeah. back. I, I when have I, a friend from Indonesia. You hit, we'll as that. soon as you see the yellow light, um, you meant to hit through three times in order to see if you can manage to gun okay, through. Definitely a superstition there. Because, yeah. I mean, what's hitting the roof going to do, right? Yeah. But mm. there are all kinds of uh, descriptions for why flashing your lights might work. There's some sort of sensor that only some people know about, and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Holding your breath as you drive past a, f um, a cemetery? Is another one I've heard of, which yeah. is really difficult if it's a really long cemetery. Yeah. Or if there's a light at the cemetery. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, be, yeah. It's stuck there. I, I, I love how there, there, there's suddenly a whole bunch of automobile superstitions that that were never there before yeah. automobile. I love that. Hmm. You know, yeah. yeah. So clearly they're being newly generated. Yeah. Or, or Henry Ford's responsible for them directly. What about red cars go faster? What? Red cars go faster. Red, red cars, cars go faster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's just because the people driving them drive faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have any evidence. I didn't do a study. Sorry. Mm. Uh, what about when it actually becomes um, deadly? Um, at the moment over in Australia, we have Leo Igwe, who is a member of the, make sure I get this right, the International Humanist and Ethical Union. And he is currently combating against uh, superstitions in, in Nigeria where people are believing that uh, young children are witches, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. are bad luck and that they are, in fact, responsible for a variety of ter tremendous and terrible um, events that are happening in the country from famine to you know, disease and war and so forth. I mean, that, that to me probably is a classic example of you know, hurting people due to superstition. Yeah, yeah, in this country, I think that's the Salem witch trials, right, yeah. when mm -hmm. we think of the... The, mat, the sort of uh, local del you know, mass delusion largely fueled by, against the desire for control, the pattern recognition, but also other mm -hmm. factors. The, uh, in, but this is the same thing is happening in other parts of the world that like you brought up, uh, Africa. And mm -hmm. other, not only are they, there, there is a superstition that, uh, for example, yeah, that, that certain segments of the population are, are witches or have magical powers such as albinos. Albinos yeah. are, have, are at great risk in these cultures because um, you know, people will, in fact, like hunt them down, kill them, cut off their limbs, and use them as lucky charms. Oh. Yeah, so that's, that's a, yeah. put somebody at pretty high risk. I think probably, again, I don't, this may blur the line between a superstition versus just a false medical treatment, but the notion that having sex with a virgin will cure you of HIV is yeah. certainly yeah, a very, happen. and of course the one way to ensure that your victim is a virgin is to get a very, very young child. So that is happening as well. So that, those are dramatic cases where superstitious, you know, false beliefs lead to horrific direct harm. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, in Chinese medicine, we hear about you know, um, people grinding up uh, tiger's bones and, yeah. and rhino horns and well, stuff like that. that and, that's kind yeah. of a, a, a funny aspect about these and uh, conspiracy. Not conspiracy theory. Sorry, that was last night. <laughs> that was last night. <laughs> Ugh, uh, about these superstitions. Yeah. Um, is that somehow? That the world becomes a metaphor for something else. That like the the rhino horn becomes the erect phallus, and somehow that right. the essenceness mm-hmm. of that hardness is going to translate to Mister mm-hmm. the guy. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. But and again, you know, you see that with the example of the of the boat flipped over. Wow. This mm-hmm. is just a symbol. It's a metaphor for what's going to happen, and maybe. Right. Uh, by manipulating the metaphor, you'll mm. change the world. You know. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, Bruce Hood wrote a lot about that. Yeah. You know about the the notion. It's, it's sympathetic magic is the no, the notion that something represents what it looks like, or and, and that derives from our notion that that things have an essence of what they are, and that essence can be captured or can you know be represented through metaphor, through just physically looking similar. And this also gets back to what I said at the very beginning, in addition to pattern recognition, which we've talked about a lot up here so far, is the hyperactive agency detection, is that we have this, just in this sense that when, when you know, the stars align, when, thing, when, when, it, when things happen, that um, not only is that a real pattern, but then we take the next step to say, okay, that's not only a real pattern, but as you said, there's a causal effect there. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, if you think about it in a you know, reductionist, materialist, you know, rational ways, how could the shirt that I wear while I'm watching the New England Patriots play affect the outcome of the game? Mm-hmm. That's different than the athlete thinking that their underwear or whatever affects their performance, because it might, because there's a direct psychological effect. Obviously, I can't have any influence through the TV to you know how my team plays, but how many people Act, be, act on those kinds of beliefs, and so you, it, you know, oftentimes I'll ask people, so how, how do you think that works? <laughs> what what is happening there? What's the connection? And they often say, I don't know, but it works. Yes. You know, there's, <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, yeah, it the, happened to my the, the sense, this profound sense that there is something in the universe, some essence or some factor that's at work, that's mysterious, is. Speaks to us in a very primitive, profound way. Uh, that I think it's, it has to do with this injecting meaning to the patterns, not just the. And our brains work this way, right? Our brains are hardwired not just to see patterns, but to give them meaning. And we do this even in the most trivial ways. So, so like when we see a pattern that represents a person's face. We, we inject all the meaning that goes along with that. Our brains do that. It actually, the, we, we know the pathways now. So yeah, then it hooks up into you know, the limbic system, which then makes us have a certain feeling about that. And if you disrupt that, um, there's actually a syndrome associated with that. When, when we don't inject the meaning and the emotions to the patterns that we see. Uh, and like, for example, if you damage that circuit, uh, a, a husband might think that um, his wife is an imposter because mm. He, he recognizes the pattern of his wife as his wife, but the, he doesn't feel towards her as he knows he's supposed to feel. And is, the only way he can make sense of that is by saying, well, it must be because she's an imposter. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's even been one case where a husband like, murdered his wife because he was convinced that she was an imposter. Yeah. I like that when it's, the, when yeah. it's your own limb. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. This isn't my limb. So, yeah, so, we, so, our, so I think that... Where superstitions are an extension of that, where we're seeing a pattern and then we imbue it with meaning, it's because the pattern without meaning doesn't doesn't help us interact with the world and control the world. Mm-hmm. So that that, that uh, meaning may be agency, meaning that there's some will behind what's happening. What's happening is deliberate. It's not random. It's not by chance. There's it's someone's deliberate choice. Some agent is at work. Um, it may be thinking that something is actually acting on its will, own will as opposed to like moving at random. Or it could be, um, this is where conspiracy theories come from too often, that mm-hmm. you're saying th- these disconnected events are not disconnected. There is some agency behind them. So again, that's just the way our brains are hardwired. That's why we are seeing new superstitions coming into play. But we also have other circuits in our brain that then reality test. They go, yeah, but does that make sense? And that's the thing I think we need to, to convince people to kick in, when you, to ask yourself, how would that work? How would that really work? And, and not just, I don't know, but it does, but 
how, what, what possible mechanism could there be for that? And that should at least give you pause, you know, before you accept the pattern is real. It's also knowing that we, we can see false patterns. If you realize that and you and resist the temptation to imbue meaning into those false patterns, then the superstitions go away, right? Mm -hmm. that, and so that's, I think, what critical thinking skeptics do, but how do we communicate that to the to the general population. I was about to say, how often does it work? I mean, you yourself saying to yeah. somebody, okay, well, how does that really, does it work all the time? Or do they just go, oh, no, shut up, no, Steve, you're the, just ruining all my fun yeah, in the no, game. The, the, the yeah. se often the sense of the pattern's real and there's an agent behind it is, mm -hmm. is just too powerful to overcome yeah. with just one encounter of rationality. That takes, that's a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. That takes time. Yeah. And there are, you know, there are, there are other dangers too. It's not, not just to the person, but it, it, particularly in, in situations where a there's something that a group of people are relying on. And, oh, and yeah. sports is, is kind of a sort of an innocuous example, but it's not entirely. What happens when somebody says, well, we lost because you didn't change your socks, or you did change yeah. your socks, as, as we expected? And that's more common than you might think. Um, a, one thing that pops into my head, this is horrific, but it was a story of, um, a, once again, it's in, in, I believe it was in India, when you know, a five-year-old girl was decapitated basically because someone blamed someone else for the things that were happening to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not unusual. And, and that's an extreme case, but we have little cases like that all the time mm -hmm. um, of, of blame that are based on superstitions. I, I had a situation where a student uh, attempted to self-harm because she believed her father was cursed and that this was a way of removing the curse. Mm -hmm. It was really horrible. Um, I guess, yeah, any, any final points in regards to how do we deal with superstitions? Any examples like, for example, in the theatre or within, as a teacher that you've attempted to, to challenge it and do they work? Oh, you know, just you, you have to become familiar. You, the funny thing is that when you start like looking through this, you start to see patterns. But now, mm. I don't know. <laughs> 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 no, but just be, you know, becoming familiar with with yeah. you know the the genres of of superstition, the ones that talk about changing the future, the ones that are related to seeing the future, mm -hmm. uh, the the ones that are related to health, and you know, um, once you you see those, that's the first step towards critically thinking, recognizing mm -hmm. what could be a superstition. Um, well, I mean, I think in the cases of the things I've discussed, pretty much, I think just, just demonstrating that you can do them without anything bad happening. Mm. But there's also a subset. Uh, critical thinking and theater don't go together no. very often. <laughs> uh, I am actually, I'm thinking of a particular person who I have worked with who's involved with the theater, who at one point or another has said that she believes that she's possessed. Oh. And uh, it's just stuff like that. But, but also, you know, I, I hear about people's horoscopes and um, somebody was talking about the Master Cleanse diet one time and I was like, maybe you should look into that a little more before you go into that. But, you know, it's it, there's a lot of it's just, uh, you know, thinking about, it's not a scientific field. It's not something where it's, it deals a lot with emotion. And emotions are, are, you know, you're supposed to bring out emotions and they're very much in the forefront. And I think, so, emo, uh, so people get tied up into emotional reactions rather than critical reactions, actually thinking about, uh, about things. So it can lead into more dangerous stuff. Uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did any of us ever have superstitions? Once in a time. I know we had Matt Lowry who had his coin stolen away from him from Margaret Downey in order to see whether or not he could handle it. And I was a little bit distressed because I thought, what's the harm with poor Matt just hanging onto his coin? It makes him happy. He's not doing anything with it. Any of us ever had superstitions that you have overthrown over the time? You know, I, I don't know that I ever had any, but my mother was raised with a lot of habits. And if you ever asked her, she didn't actually believe anything was going to happen. And I still, I still throw salt over my left shoulder, my right shoulder with my left hand. It's a habit. It, Aren't you? It's, it, it's, but I don't think anything bad's going to happen. And if I don't do it, I don't feel anxious. So I, I know it's not a compulsion. It's just, it's more like 
that's what I grew up doing. You didn't put shoes on the table and, you know. Um, but that just seems sensible. I mean, yeah, shoes on the table. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, even in a box when they have never been worn. You know, oh. It, it, it's just one of those things that I, until I questioned it, um, I did it. And then when I questioned it and realized it was silly, it was such a habit that I, it's like, it's just what you do. It's just like you do it without thinking, you know. Yeah. I have more neuroses than most people, um, but, but you know, when it, when it comes to writing, I mean, I, there certainly are magic pens. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just um, uh, I hear Marion Cole's got a fantastic magical typewriter. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> um, but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, more just little obsessive things than than, mm. than anything that I would imbue with special powers, mm. except for the Bic. That's yeah. That's, that's sacred. Yeah, so I don't think I had any real, like, long-term superstitions. They more like the transient ones. I did have little OCD things, like when I was younger, like um, preferring even over odd numbers, those kind of things, yeah. or mm. com completion obsessions. You know, completing I have to a sequence, do things in reverse. Things. Yeah, little things like that. I think I don't Symmetry. know. How, Symmetry. Did you do the symmetry thing? Yeah, symmetry kind of compulsions. Yeah, those kind of things. And I outgrew them, you know, when I was very young. But there, there was those become become a little superstitious. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we discovered with our research that crossing fingers and touching wood are probably now more cultural than superstition because we do it just as a as a cultural gesture. Yeah. yeah. Or touching wood doesn't you know, or touching wood doesn't mean anything anymore. It's, it's just a communication. A just a, another yeah. non nonverbal communication. Yeah. I still go like this in, in hope for people, but I don't really believe it. It's just <laughs> more like thinking of you. I'm thinking, thinking of you. you. I hope it happens. I hope it happens. Crossed fingers. I, I used to uh, carry on stage with me uh, when I was in high school. My high school won uh, the state one act competition, and I used to take the medal on stage with me for years. I didn't really think, you know, it, I, if I forgot it, it wasn't a big deal. And I eventually stopped doing it because it came, became a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, but I did that for years. I just liked to have it on me while I was on stage, uh, mm. you know, just to have as, I guess, a, a lucky charm or whatever. But. Mm. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to confess your superstitions, please come on up to the microphone or have any questions for the panelists. Thank you. Can I have the kitty? It's not my kitty. kitty. Just, just want to say thank you to you guys. It was very interesting. Um, the, the history behind some superstitions I, I found real interesting over the years, everything from saying God bless you to sneezing and all that. Uh, I had a boss one time, uh, university I was at, <clears throat> he was a Mexican-American, the first one with a major position there too on the staff, and he bought his first brand new car ever and took it down to the local Kundera to have, the, have it blessed uh, against curses. And I kind of teased him about it, and he goes, oh, I don't really believe in all that. To prove it, I took it over to the uh, priest to have his blessing put on it, too. <laughs> took care of it all. Uh, a lot of what you said, uh, particularly uh, Mr. Novella there, uh, I've just read in uh, one of Shermer's, Michael mm -hmm. Shermer's books I just read. And I want to mention that to people here, mainly because you can go look at the books out there on a table at the... Skepticality, I think Skeptic, it is. Skeptic Society table? Skeptic Society table. Uh, he's got some of those books on the theory behind uh, belief systems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pattern recognition, all that you were talking right, about. Right. So you can you can take a look at it and, and uh, before you even think about buying it. Yeah. That one's the thanks. Believing Brain. That's the one you're talking about. It's right. yeah. Patternicity well, and... The, 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 the really <laughs> fun one to read is Why Smart People Believe Weird Things. Yes. Right. That's, yeah. that's the fun that's one. one. Uh, I guess this one was a little bit more directed toward uh, the Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was just itching in the back of my head about um, uh, theaters, like about uh, not saying good luck, just break oh, your leg. Oh, yeah, that one. I don't, why, <laughs> how did I forget that one? Yeah, in, in um, dance you say merd. You say the French word for shit uh, as you go on the stage, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, yeah it's, it's bad luck to say good luck. Yeah. Um, you say break a leg. Because the thought is, if you say good luck, then probably something bad's going to happen. So you just tell someone to, you know, sub, you know, to, uh, I hope something bad happens, and hopefully it won't. 
uh, is, I think, the thought behind it. It's kind of, I don't know if anyone ever actually believes that. I mean, if you say good luck, somebody will say, you're not supposed to say that. Uh, but they're not going to yell at you or hit you with things. But um, and uh, or break a leg, yeah, yeah, and or break your leg. Uh, but and I, I say it myself. I don't, you know, just it's a tradition. I, that one's kind of more of a tradition now, I think, than anyone actually believing that anything's going to happen. Someone yeah, said so. that to me before the panel. Break a leg. Break, break a leg. leg. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like what we do now. Well, and also, I just thought I just remembered something. Uh, there's also a, a thought that it may actually come from. Uh, it may have originated uh, in, a, I'm trying to think of the time period, it may have been Elizabethan, where uh, if the audience liked a performance, they would throw money on stage. Ooh. And so when you bent down to pick up the money, you were breaking a leg. Hmm. That, was the, that was the phrase, that's what you were doing. So the act of kneeling was to yeah, the act to of kneeling was breaking. called breaking a leg. Uh, and so there's also that there's kind of two different thoughts, and I think maybe because the money thing went away, so people forgot about it, so then they had, well, why did we say break a leg? Um, but yeah, I forgot about that part, but, but that's probably most likely where it originated, and then it kind of evolved into a new meaning. So. Well, you learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good panel. Uh, Barbara used the term habit about the, the salt shaker, and I'm wondering, this is for everyone, what do you think the difference is between a tradition, a superstition, and a ritual? Hmm. And does one merge into the other as an overlapping de- Venn diagrammy thing? Well, I, I think a tradition is something traditionally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't well, use the song share. from Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ruin my plans. Um, I, I think a tradition is kind of something you share, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think would that's think it, yeah. the key. Thinking. I mean, it is a rich, it's a shared ritual. It is a tradition. Yeah. So there is a ritual, but I think the you could have a private, personal ritual that you do, but I wouldn't call it a tradition hmm. unless there's some kind of shared element to it. But I, otherwise, hmm. I don't see what the difference is. And, and I think a superstition is is when you expect something to happen because right. of it or not happen. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Why are these things always too tall? <laughs> um, I, a few things that you said along the way um, made me think. First, the, the arch that the people at that university pass under, I believe that's the University of Kansas in Lawrence. That um, be, yeah. That's where my wife graduated and I work for them now. And wow. it's, it's a rite of passage yeah. to pass through. So more symbolism than superstition. Mm-hmm. I mean, she did it. And mm-hmm. it's like, you wait until you finally earned the right so it was less of a superstition and more of a, I'm marking the day I finally pass through that, that um, rite of passage. Yeah. It's like in the a physical that, way. Yeah, it's like the lawns in Oxford and Cambridge. Apparently only the dons are allowed to walk on them or something like that, I've heard. That, and all the students have to walk around the paths because they haven't earned the right to step on the grass. As well. yeah. like I wonder that. who came up with that one. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one was um, the kids full get moon. off the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> the full moon thing. Um, do you, do any of you guys do any outdoor activities, camping, um, etc.? Mm-hmm. I'm Australian. We live everywhere. Well, there you goddamn go. camp. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm an avid outdoorsman, <laughs> and I was in the army. So, when is it easiest to do mischievous things at night? on the full moon. It was because you could see what you were doing to go cause trouble. It has nothing to do with superstition until people started adding it to it, but that was probably the origin of it. Because if you've gone camping at night, you're like, dude, I can see everything. Let's go do something. Well, what? there's also yeah, there's also an element of predictability there. And if you can predict something, then you can control something about it. So even if you can't control, we can't control the phase of the moon, obviously, but if we know it's coming, we can prepare. And you can plan for antics. Yeah. And the last one, um, can any of you guys rationalize the curse of the Bambino <laughs> as superstition or other? I'm Australian, so this is out of my, my field. I don't know what, that, what she's talking oh, okay. about. Okay, the very brief story. The Red Sox, um, 80-something, 90-something years ago now, um, sold Babe Ruth. <gasps> Um, and since then, they, after winning several World Series practically in a row, couldn't win a World Series for 86 years. The season they finally won the World Series, um, 
so many little things. The guy who ended up winning World Series MVP did a commercial where he dreamed of being the World Series MVP, which to do that you have to get to the World Series and then win the World Series and then be that player on the team to be the MVP. Stuff right. like that. I, post hoc thinking. They, they, uh, I mm. think they beat the Cardinals, right? They did. Who, uh-huh. They did, but they went through the Yankees to do it. Right. Oh, is that part of it? We had to defeat the Yankees. Right. Um, the Cardinals had nothing to do with it. However, the, during the actual World Series, full moon, blue moon, total lunar eclipse, and a blood sacrifice. Yeah, but the thing is... Well, they, clearly, <laughs> they clearly sold something to the devil. I mean, that... You see, we never have these bloody problems with cricket, you yeah. see. You guys got to get yourself a bit I of sport. I think it's nuts, but it's hilarious. I would be impressed if somebody actually wrote a book that they could say, that they could demonstrate all these things are going to happen and if these things happen then you'll win the world series and they could show they could demonstrate that you know it was buried underground for five years yeah. before because well, also- that's really post hoc you know the people dig for things it's sort of like the connection between right. um, what was the, the Lincoln Lincoln and Kennedy, Kennedy yeah. thing yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, you, it's looking for patterns after yeah. the fact yeah. with open ended criteria so yeah maybe those things may be unusual but there's a, a million things that you, could have been unusual so right. the, it, would have be, it would be remarkable if you couldn't find something unusual about the Red Sox ultimate victory Right, that would be remarkable. The fact that you can find some pattern is actually is statistically almost guaranteed. It was, it was even statistically odd. I mean, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in any of the superstitions. But at the same time, it's like, wow, there's a lot of head-scratch-worthy stuff on this one. Well, well that's because you're asking the wrong yeah. question. Maybe the odds of those particular things happening were, were individually low, but the odds of something unusual happening was guaranteed. That's the difference. And that's why you need to predict specific weird things, not just look after the fact at weird things that happen. Yeah. There was real, one. real quick demonstration. Sure. Pick a number between one and six million. Got it? Yep. Okay, what is it? 972,842. What are the, I know what the odds are. There were one in what, what did I say, 600 six million? million? Yeah. Actually it was six. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> then you lied. But still, the odds of that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's post hoc. Yeah, it was just a really interesting one. I just wanted to see what you had to say. I, I learned something new about a, a American <laughs> sport, so <laughs> very, very yeah. superstitious. Cool. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking part. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.